education tips and strategy session. Um, in terms of uh, this one hour session, I think you're going to get a lot out of it uh, to get a better sense of the application process to the MA in Climate and Society program. And um, my name is just right from the top, um, Alfred Ayub. I'm the Director of Admissions here at Columbia Climate School. Uh, also joining me today is Carrie Shimkus, our Associate Director of Graduate Programs. She is going to be um, assisting with uh, our Q&A, um, but uh, who knows, she might also be a, a speaker at any moment uh, as it relates to our, our um, ending Q&A, so to speak. Just to go over briefly the agenda, we're going to go ahead and introduce our panelists shortly. Um, all of our panelists are current MA in Climate and Society students. All of them um, were, of course, successful applicants to this program and can share some really valuable insights on how they approach the application process. So we'll be doing formal introductions momentarily. We're gonna go into a deep dive on the application components, um, talk about kind of our criteria for evaluation, the holistic review process. We'll also touch on our transcript requirements, letters of recommendation, and then finally conclude with the statement of purpose, um, which I find always to be the most exciting aspect of an application. Uh, and then we will wrap everything up with panelist Q&A. Um, and truly, questions help everybody here. I want to emphasize that. It's not often that you get to ask questions of four current students with very different journeys in the MA in Climate and Society program in a single webinar uh, or virtual session. So I really want to encourage questions during our Q&A session. It's, it's going to be of great value to all of our participants. In terms of how we are conducting questions today, because we are in a formal webinar room, please type your questions in the Q&A feature. That is where we will be monitoring questions and addressing your questions. Again, please type your questions in the Q&A feature. Uh, and again, the Q&A will be conducted toward the end. Our panelists will be speaking throughout the presentation, kind of sharing their insights and perspectives and key sections. But the Q&A will be opened up at the end of the presentation. So what I'd like to now go ahead and do is allow our panelists to introduce themselves. And I'll begin starting from left to right. So if we can go ahead and allow um, Abhinav, could you go ahead and share with us um, kind of your academic and professional background uh, prior to enrolling in Columbia Climate School, where you came from, what you studied, um, just giving us a little bit of background, that would be wonderful. Uh, thank you. Uh, so I am Abhinav. I am from India. Basically, before coming to Colombia, I did my undergrad in metallurgical and materials engineering from India. And after that, I have done a second master's in forestry management as well. And before joining Colombia, I worked for around two years in a nonprofit called as Care in a project funded by Gates Foundation. I was working in Bihar in their public health project. That's about me. Thank you, Avanath. And Victoria? Hi, I'm Victoria. I just graduated this past May from Villanova University with a degree in environmental science and geography. Um, in terms of professional background, um, I really got into research during my junior year. I worked under my advisor, and he's one who pushed me to apply for an REU and for grad school. And so that's ultimately how I ended up here at Columbia. And yeah, excited to talk with you all. Thank you. Samuel? Um, hi, my name is Sam. Um, I'm from Maryland. Uh, I went, I'm fresh out of undergrad. I just graduated in May of 22, like Victoria. I studied history and political science, and I did a lot of um, work with uh, the local governments where I went to uh, college working on their climate action plans, and I was also uh, heavily involved with um, uh, the Sunrise Movement and uh, climate-related organizing. I'm really excited to talk to you all about the application process. And last but certainly not least, Emily. Hi, y'all. Um, my name is Emily. Um, I'm also a recent college graduate. I graduated in May of 22 um, with a bachelor's in um, anthropology and social policy analysis and environmental studies. Um, so I was really involved in research in undergrad, um, and I did research across all four major schools at my university, so like the School of Engineering, Science, um, Arts, and Social Studies. 
Um, and I'm also one of the um, in one of the Diamond Science Global Fellows for the Climate School. Thank you, Emily. So now just go, to go ahead and, and actually I just want to confirm we are recording this session, um, just letting everybody to, um, know that we are recording the session. So um, just bearing that in mind. Um, so I want to now touch on kind of our admissions and review process here at Columbia Climate School. So first and foremost, it's a holistic review of all application components um, at the Climate School. Um, we are definitely interested in understanding your academic abilities, uh, your trajectory, what you studied. Um, we also want to understand really of great value your commitment to um, the climate uh, crisis and climate issues. We also want to better understand your fit within the MA in Climate and Society program and how will you contribute to the learning community. Um, so whenever students or admissions committees review candidates, they always think of when you're sitting in the classroom, what perspective will you lend to your peers? And also, most importantly, what will you gain from the program itself? So, um, you know, is the MA Climate and Society and specifically our core courses of critical value to you in terms of your ultimate goals? So our admissions committee takes all of these into account when reviewing a candidate. And one thing I like to stress is that when we mean holistic review, we mean, we mean every element of your application is carefully reviewed and, and assessed, and that there is absolutely no formula to an admissions decision. So I'm going to mention this later in the presentation, and actually, forgive me, I noticed there's a typo on the, on the actual slide itself, but what I want to just stress is that uh, there is no minimum GPA times Y standardized test score equals up or down decision. They're really truly looking at your um, academic history your statement of purpose, your letters of recommendations, um, your resume to truly understand your goals and motivations and ultimately how our program is of value to you and how you are going to contribute to our learning community. So that's kind of the admissions review process. Again, I wanna stress it's, it's a holistic process. In terms of that holistic process and the application components, we have an application form. I know that many of you joining me today have already started an application. Maybe you haven't submitted it yet. We also require that you upload your resume, transcripts. We will take unofficial transcripts. I'll go into that shortly. Two letters of recommendation. And then we also ask for your statement of purpose and possibly a standardized test. So a TOEFL, IELTS, or Duolingo, if applicable. We'll talk about that shortly. And then finally, um, a completely optional standardized test, although one that you are able to submit if you decide to, is a GRE. Um, our admissions committee um, is not uh, going to uh, specifically seek out the GRE from candidates. However, if you do decide to submit it, it will be a part of the holistic review process. And I went ahead and included the ETS code if you do have a GRE score that you would like to submit to Columbia Climate School. So again, that holistic review process is going to involve reviewing all components of your application, everything listed here um, to make that ultimate decision. To just briefly go over those app the application deadline, our priority deadline is January 15th, 2023. That's January 15th, 2023 at 11.59 p.m. Um, EST. By submitting by the priority deadline, your decision is going to be released in March. This is a highly recommended deadline for anybody interested in climate and society fellowship consideration. Um, and again, any of you joining me today, which I applaud all of you for doing this research um, today and, and hearing our application tips and strategy session, if you are doing that, take advantage of the January 15th, 2023 deadline. It only benefits you to at least get a decision sooner. That gives you more time for planning um, and making a decision. It increases your chances of fellowship consideration. And then finally, um, and uh, I appreciate Emily noting she is one of our Diamondstein Spielvogel Fellowship recipients this year. Um, the final deadline for Diamondstein Spielvogel Fellowships, um, in order to apply for that, it's a separate application, but in order to apply for that fellowship, you have to submit your admissions application by January 15th, 2023. And the Diamondstein Spielvogel application will open up in the application portal. And then you'll have until January 31st, 2023 to submit that application. 
So that's our priority deadline. And I sincerely hope all of you decide to take advantage of that priority deadline, um, given that we're still in November. And then our final deadline is March 1st, 2023. And that um, yeah, time is getting that in by 11.59 PM EST. When we say deadline, by the way, we also want to see all of your application components submitted by then. So not just you submitting the application, but we want your recommendation letters, for example, submitted by then as well. So when you're speaking with your recommenders and they wanna understand their time, how much time do they have to write this recommendation letter? You should be definitely asking them to submit the recommendation letter, for example, by the priority deadline, January 15th, 2023. So just to briefly go over the transcripts, and I promise we're going to um, loop our panelists in shortly to share a little bit more about their perspectives, especially as it relates to recommendation letters and the statement of purpose. Um, transcripts, you will upload your unofficial transcripts from every post-secondary in, um, institution attended um, to the online application. So in the education history section, you will upload all transcripts with which you attended. If you went to, for example, Borough Manhattan Community College, and then you transferred to um, uh, Syracuse University, and then you also completed a graduate degree at University of California, Davis, we would need all three of those transcripts. The unofficial transcripts need to have course titles listed, grades received, the duration of study, and the degree or diploma received if applicable. We do have a number of students that apply to our program during their senior year, so you would simply upload the most recent college transcript that you have with your most recent grades. Some, a little tip that we like to note is do not list schools that are not colleges or universities. We have a number of students, um, many of them are pivots to climate. You know, this is a recent decision and maybe they've done a lot of kind of Coursera type courses or edX type courses, but you enrolled in these courses, non-credit bearing, no letter grades. It was in an unofficial capacity. Do not list those. We're only interested in colleges or universities where you received um, credits and letter grades. Um, also, do not list information for study at high schools or any secondary schools. I just want to note that as well. To continue this kind of transfer, transcript co conversation, admitted students will be required to provide official transcripts. So if admitted to the program, you will then, as a part of our verification process, be required to submit official college transcripts from the university directly to Columbia Climate School. They have to be in electronic format. Um, and there is information on our website as it relates to that. But for admissions decisions, to receive an admissions decision, you will simply upload your unofficial college transcript for that decision. Something else I just want to note is if you're an international applicant or attended a university outside the United States, and you're admitted, we would need a WES evaluation for that um, transcript as well. I want to stress as it relates to transcripts, again, I mentioned it earlier, but there are no minimum GPAs as a part of the MA in Climate and Society program. Our admissions committee does not have a minimum GPA guideline with which they must abide by. So I just want to stress that it is a holistic review process. And uh, some additional tips as a current student. So any of you joining us today that is currently enrolled in your undergraduate university, upload the transcripts with grades from your preceding term. I do not recommend waiting for your fall grades. However, it's preferable if in progress, progress grades are listed on the transcript. So meaning um, don't feel like you have to wait to submit your, your unofficial transcripts once the fall grades are posted, but it would be great to submit the transcript with the in progress that shows your fall semester and the in-progress um, uh, record for that semester. Again, to receive an admissions decision, you will simply upload your unofficial college transcripts. If admitted, that's when you would need the official submitted. To provide some additional nuance for any candidates with international transcripts, um, academic um, uh, records not in English must be accompanied by a certified English translation, even as a part of the application review process. So again, if you have transcripts that are not in English, let's say you attended a, a university in China, we would need that transcript translated um, uh, to English. 
and upload it to your admissions application. Translations must be literal, i.e. word for word, and complete versions of the original record also must be shared with us. So we would want both your Chinese transcript as well as your translation. And then you would upload um, the transcripts with the accompanying translation. Forgive me, I mentioned that. If admitted, a West evaluation will be required for institutions outside the United States. Um, and specific instructions will be provided for electronic submission of official transcripts after you have accepted the offer of admission. One thing I do want to mention is if you're an international student and you already received an official West evaluation, a course by course West evaluation, along with your original transcripts, you are welcome to send official West evaluations to us. Um, we've already started receiving them. We are happy to then include that in your admissions application. However, I wanna stress it's not required as a part of the admissions process. You can simply upload your unofficial transcripts along with a translation. But if you've already done or performed your West evaluation, feel free to send that to us as well. In terms of standardized tests, um, we, we accept three different English language tests, either the TOEFL, IELTS, or Duolingo English test. Um, it's required if um, your native language is not English and the bachelor's degree is from an institution where English is not the primary language of instruction. So if, you, if your native language is not English and your bachelor's degree is not from an, um, an institution where the primary language of instruction is English, then we would need either the TOEFL, IELTS, or Duolingo English test. Scores must be taken within two years um, of the application deadline and official scores must be received um, by the application deadline as well. Um, be sure to use the correct school code. I wanna just note the TOEFL, if you decide to take the TOEFL and send it to us, the code is D144. And then because of the nature of Columbia University, we are an institution whereby all the courses are going to be taught in English. It's a rigorous curriculum. There are high expectations. Um, we do have minimum scores associated with um, uh, the English tests. So we would need at least a 100 on the TOEFL, a 7.5 or higher on the IELTS, or a 135 on the Duolingo English test. We're only looking for, if you do, if you are required to submit one of these tests, we only need one of these tests. We do not need all three. I just want to stress that as well. So I'm going to loop into the, the, um, the panelists now. Um, so one moment, but I just wanna just cover in terms of letters of recommendation, we do require two letters of recommendation. One of them should come from an academic recommender if you've been enrolled in a university within the last five years. Um, and then one could be an, uh, the second one could be academic as well, or alternatively a professional recommendation. Choose people who know you well and interact with you in different capacities. That's one thing I always like to note. So for example, um, maybe you want an environmental science professor um, if you're currently enrolled in undergrad, but then you also worked with a political science professor that knows you well. They could add very different kind of perspectives um, to your ability. So I just like to, to note that um, choosing diverse um, recommendations or could, could bode well for your candidacy. Ideally, letters should address both your academic abilities and your experiences um, or potential in the climate space. And when approaching recommenders, ensure that they have time to write you a strong letter of recommendation. Do, I strongly discourage you from asking a recommender to submit a strong recommendation letter with just a one week deadline. That's not appropriate. You really need to go to them and give them plenty of time. Um, and then provide an overview of your program of interest. I always recommend to students, schedule time, uh, schedule a Zoom meeting, have a coffee um, meeting with your recommender, talk about your goals, your ambitions, share with them um, your resume, even your statement of purpose, so they get a better idea and a better sense of your goals and motivations that could certainly help um, with a strong letter of recommendation. And then, Recommendation letters, I just want to note this, some additional nuance, and some of this might be very common sense, but recommendation letters must be written in English or translated into English. All letters must be submitted directly using the system generated link. Um, so when you are filling out our admissions application, it's gonna ask for the name and email address of your recommender. As soon as you provide that information, 
the recommender gets a secure link emailed to them, they are the ones that have to use that link to upload the letter, okay? And please refrain from asking, and again, this might seem common sense, but you'd be surprised. <laughs> please refrain from asking relatives, family or personal friends and classmates for recommendation letters. Those would not be appropriate recommenders. Again, they should either be academic or professional in nature. One other element I wanna note on recommendation letters, and then I'm gonna to pivot to our panelists to kind of share their experiences and how they approach this process. Um, when you are in the admissions application, you will be asked whether or not you waive your right to access your letter of recommendation. If you waive your right, you will not be able to view the letters of recommendation submitted, even if you are admitted and enroll in the university. If you do not waive your right, your letter will become part of your student record, and you will have the right to inspect that record, including your letters, if you are admitted and choose to enroll in Columbia Climate School. That's the key, choose to enroll. I really want you to be thoughtful when you are thinking about whether or not to waive your right for a letter of recommendation. You cannot reverse this decision. And you definitely, in absolute terms, want to have a conversation with your recommenders, especially if you are choosing to not waive your right. If you are indicating that you wish to review that letter of recommendation and your recommender is not aware of that decision, that could cause some issues. And then they might say, well, I'm not willing to write, write a recommendation letter on your behalf. And then you would say, well, then I'll reverse it. I'll go ahead and waive my right. Guess what? We can't reverse it. So be very thoughtful and mindful. There's many reasons why you might want to waive your right to review that letter. It might give confidence in your recommender. Um, again, bearing in mind, you're only asking for individuals who you feel will and have the ability to write strong recommendation letters. And this is something else I just wanna know. When you select, if you waive your right or don't waive your right, again, your recommender will see that selection as will the admissions committee. The admissions committee is privy to that information. They will see whether or not you waive your right to writing a letter of recommendation. So again, I just wanna give that one additional nuance as well. Again, when you make that decision, it cannot be reversed. Okay, actually, before I do that, let me go back to the letters of recommendation. And what I wanna do now is loop back in our panelists. And I'm just gonna randomly select somebody. Um, so let's go with maybe Emily. Um, Emily, could you share, um, you know, how did you select your recommenders? How did you approach them? Um, do you have any kind of best practices or tips that you would wanna to give to prospective students in this journey? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I selected my letters. I think I submitted three letters of recommendation. So um, one was an advisor who I'd worked closely with since my um, sophomore year of undergrad. She, um, I think, knew my, I think, like, knew just a lot about, like, me personally um, and was able to kind of speak to some research experience I've had as well as um, I taught a course for sophomore engineering students. So she was kind of able to speak to my, um, like, role as like, an educator in, like, curriculum development. Um, I also picked a professor who I'd worked um, really closely with on both a internship and in one of her courses um, who I thought could speak to like my academic work. Um, and then lastly, I submitted a letter of rec from a professor in the earth science department who I did like a interdisciplinary research like project with him um, over the summer. So um, I think I tried to identify people who I thought could speak to my work in different capacities. Um, and then also, I think that just in terms of best practices, um, I think it's really, something that I think people kind of might, or maybe like, I don't know if um, this is like something that people tend to forget, but I think like following up with your recommenders after they write you a letter of rec and just like thanking them, like, um, and letting them know like where you end up going to school or like what your plan ultimately is, I think is like kind of a step that um, a lot of people appreciate and will kind of like keep those connections in the future. Thanks, Emily, I appreciate that. And when one element I do want to know um, is our application process actually changed a little this year. So this year, we're only allowing two letters of recommendation. Emily's correct. It was different last year. 
This year we're only allowing two and that's the maximum, unfortunately, that we can accept um, among all applicants. So just wanting to note that one nuance, but thank you Emily for that, that kind of insight. Um, how about Samuel? Sam, do you wanna share kind of how you approached the process? When did you ask for recommendation letters as well? When did you begin that conversation? Yeah, so for me, uh, I, I also, you know, asked for three, but it was kind of ironic because only two actually submitted them. So I don't know what to do with that information. Yeah. Um, but I guess I mean, it's just like follow up with whoever you're, you know, asking for a recommendation. Um, but, you know, so I was an undergraduate. So I asked uh, one of my advisors who I'd had a few courses with. Um, he was somebody who um, had, you know, overseen, you know, my intellectual academic journey. And then um, I also asked a um, supervisor who I had interned with for a couple of years, and um, he um, helped me through a few of the projects that I worked on, including um, the climate action planning for the local governments and with the school and stuff. Um, so yeah, just basically like it was someone who's really with working with me closely in like the whole academic sphere, but then also someone from like my more like internship work sphere. Excellent. Thanks, Sam. How about Avinav? How did you approach recommendations? So uh, because I was in my second previous master's for like, I had a gap for two years. So one of my recommendation letters, I asked my supervisor where I was working. Uh, and the other one that I asked was my professor from my previous master's. I worked with him closely on a research project. So uh, he could speak about my research, research abilities and my professional capabilities. That is why I chose him and my supervisor. The one point that I want to focus on is you should always keep uh, like the application requires two recommendation letters, but you should always keep one as a uh, option. Like you should approach three or four professors at least so that if some professor could not upload the uh, letter at time, you have a backup in hand. Otherwise it will become at the last moment, it can become a little messy and tricky. So that is what I would suggest that you have a backup as well. Thank you, Abhinav. I appreciate that. And then um, finally, Victoria, how, how did you approach the recommendation process? Yeah, so I, I asked really early, like I think September of my senior year, but I was also applying um, for a bunch of other stuff at the time. So it ended up working out when I made the decision to apply to grad school. I already had recommenders ready to go. In terms of who I asked, like a lot of people have already mentioned, they asked their academic advisor, um, uh, my advisor also taught a bunch of class. I had like four classes with him. Um, he knew me since like my sophomore year. And he was also just like, he could also kind of like attest to like my work ethic. Like I would always be like in his early 8 a.m. class because of crew practice. And so like he would like, would always like check in. So like I had like a personal relationship with him. I asked my um, uh, research advisor from my REU experience the summer of my junior year. And then I asked my senior capstone advisor as well. Um, yeah, I would just recommend if you like, I'm sure all of you are way ahead of the curve and have already asked, but like, if not, I would definitely ask now because if you want something that really talks about who you are as a student and like as a person, like that takes time and like professors and advisors are very busy. So like just getting them to like agree to write a letter for you is a lot and also I think like Emily already brought this up but like definitely like write your uh, recommenders like thank you cards like after because like it is like a lot um like my professor like I was fortunate enough where my recommenders spent like a few weeks working on mine and they would check in with me so I feel like that's like the least that you could do to say thank you yes excellent point thank you everybody for that so now what we're going to do and again we have Q&A so if you guys have additional questions about letters of rec um, for our panelists, we're totally going to get to that. I want to now transition specifically to the statement of purpose. And one thing I do want to know is, um, as you can imagine, I noted that our recommend our requirements altered slightly this year. So our statement of purpose prompt is is a little different this year than it was last year. Um, so, but I still think a lot of the the principles that with which our panelists are going to be sharing are relevant, um, regardless of the exact nature of the prompt. Um, they all wrote, I can, I can firmly attest to this, phenomenal statements of purpose. Um, so let me just go ahead and just briefly touch on what the prompt is this year, and then I'm going to give some broad overview on, on what we're looking for in a statement of purpose, and then I'd love to hear how our panelists approach their brainstorming process. How, when did they start writing it? Things like that. But 
Our prompt right um, this year is please share, and it's a 1,000 word prompt. And we did throw a lot in here, so forgive us, but we just wanna make sure that you know exactly what we're looking for. Please share the key experiences that have contributed to your commitment to work on climate change issues. In addition, what are your academic and professional goals and what knowledge and skills you are hoping to develop through enrollment in Columbia Climate School? Finally, why is enrollment in climate and society critical in helping you achieve your goals? And which climate and society core course are you most excited to complete? So that's going to be specifically this prompt, um, and that is this prompt this year. When you're thinking about the statement of purpose, something that we really want to emphasize is this is your voice. This is truly the element of your application that you have 100% control over. This is, I always like to note that you can think of the admissions application as the painting and the statement of purpose in the frame. It's literally helping our admissions committee understand your goals, your motivations. This is an opportunity for you to self-reflect um, and describe your journey to this point. You know, so what is your climate story? That's something that many of our admissions committee members always say, what's the student's climate story? How did they come to, to being passionate about this issue, this subject? Um, who are you? Why are you passionate about climate issues? In this, you wanna articulate your goals. What are your objectives? How do you want to make an impact? And then demonstrate how the MA in Climate and Society will help you achieve your goals. Something I just want to note, because some students get very intimidated by this, and you know, being exploratory is welcome. Um, I'm, I'm gonna allow the panels to kind of discuss their journeys and their goals, but I can say we have many students that are very exploratory. They don't have the exact nature of, I'm going to be entering this professional role in this industry post-degree. Some of our students are very deliberate about that, and others just know that they want to work in the climate space and they want to work with certain populations or certain regional issues. So being exploratory is absolutely fine. I don't want everybody to come away feeling like they have to say the exact job title that they will be landing post this degree, but understanding and making sure that what your goals are, what you're hoping to accomplish is, is exactly what our program can complement is, is important. So what I'd like to do now as it relates, and then I'll just give a couple very basic do's and don'ts. Again, these are very basic and just helpful guides. What we always like to stress is with a statement of purpose, do edit and seek feedback. Remember, this is a writing sample for you. Um, this is you putting your best foot forward. Um, also clearly articulate your fit with the MA in Climate and Society program. Um, one thing I like to note, somebody did email me to say, is it okay if I seek feedback on my personal statement? Yes. What we would have an issue with, not feedback with, from us, forgive me, but within your network, it has to be your voice. You obviously have to have written it. So, you know, but seeking feedback is oftentimes a recommendation I make is share the prompt with somebody and then say, okay, can you please read my statement of purpose? Does it answer those questions? Do you understand why I'm interested in this program? Can you articulate? to articulate what my ultimate goals are. Um, so, so that's something that I just always like to say. Um, start early, brainstorm now. Now is a critical time this month of November. If you haven't started your statement of purpose, now is the time to begin. Um, and share your academic, professional, and personal trajectory. Things that we don't want you to do is copy and paste a, pers um, uh, a statement of purpose for a different program. It happens. It's unfortunate. We recognize you're all competitive students and you're applying to many different schools and programs, but we recommend that, again, um, our prompt is fairly specific and the nature of this statement of purpose should be tailored to that prompt. Do not copy, I don't wanna see another school in your statement of purpose, just throwing that out there. Um, don't summarize your resume. Your resume is a document that you've already uploaded. We do not need to hear, I then went to this job and then I went to this job and then I did this. Your resume serves that purpose. There might be elements of your resume that you wish to expand upon that can shed light on your climate journey. There might be an experience in your resume that's going to really highlight your fit for this program and your motivation. That's a different story, but do not summarize your resume. And then finally, Use space sharing information that is already in your application. So do not take information that you've already shared and then just continue to rinse and repeat it in your statement of purpose. So I'm gonna now take a pause. I'm gonna go back to this, the general guide, guiding principles, but I think 
a lot of students have most of their questions relating to the statement of purpose. And as I noted earlier, our panelists, I can attest, wrote wonderful statements of purpose. Um, so um, if we could go ahead and maybe begin with um, Victoria, um, can you share a little bit about you know, how did you just um, decide on a topic or a structure for your statement of purpose and kind of what brainstorming process did you use to figure out what you wanted to write about? Um, you know, maybe even sharing your climate story today would be very helpful. Yeah, absolutely. So I, as terms of like when I started, I feel like I started back in like August, like September, because like the brainstorm, at least for me, I take forever to brainstorm and to narrow down on a topic, but in terms of like my climate story and like what I settled on, I feel like most, like the reason like why I'm in this space is really to, is tied closely to my heritage as like a black and indigenous person. So I really use that as a starting point for my personal statement. It also like um, one, because like it helped me like explain like why I did certain opportunities that were um, like on my resume, like really tying things that like, rather than just saying like, well, I did this over the summer of like 2019, where it's like, well, I did this because like this organization or this research involved really close ties to environmental justice, which is something that I can see myself doing in professional space, like after I graduate from Columbia University, et cetera. Um, in terms of like narrowing down, like when it was finished, I had a lot, of, I would, I would say like a big um, piece of advice I would give is get a lot of people to read it. If you have a research, um, not research, if you have um, professional development, like office, like at your school, um, use it. Like they're normally like, the people like who go over like interview prep, but they will look at personal statements. And so I recommend like using that resource if you have it. If you don't, I also, use, one of my best friends was an English major. So I also had her read it a few times just to make sure it was like grammatically sound and everything like flowed together. Cause there were like in this question this year, there are a lot of things, uh, points that you have to hit on. Yes. Um, and then, yeah, don't be like, it took me several times and like revisions to get my story on paper. And so don't freak out if you can't do it on the first try. Multiple revisions is good. Excellent. Thanks, Victoria. I appreciate that. Um, Sam, how did you approach the statement of purpose? Any kind of helpful tips, brainstorming exercises, even timeline when you're thinking of doing this? Yeah, definitely. Um, so I, I think one thing that, you know, I've been preparing and that I think like everyone is kind of you know, general advice is having like a general application, but then also figuring out how to cater it specifically towards the program. Um, so first I, um, you know, I definitely had like a concrete writing sample talking about, you know, all of my past experiences and how they're like interwoven with my broader ideals and then how it's also interwoven with my education, you know, so I talked about how like history and political science, I'm learning a lot about like how change occurs and how like I wanted to help create that change in my community um, through, you know, working with local governments and working with civil society. Um, and so one thing that I did was um, I was researching the um, Climate Society website and I was looking at the different uh, courses. And so I um, focused on how my education and how my past experiences were uh, very uh, interrelated and intertwined with many of the courses um, that are uh, being offered at the program. So, um, you know, I, for one example, I worked on a climate vulnerability assessment for the um, uh, local government where I went to school. And I talked about how that was relating to the um, uh, managing and adapting course and how, um, you know, I, you know, that experience would help me in the future and just, you know, coming to Columbia would definitely strengthen the skills that I'd already worked on. Um, so definitely, um, you know, intertwining what you've done with the program itself, um, but also multiple drafts, you know, it's something I think getting it under a thousand words is definitely one of the harder parts. Um, because you got to be really concrete of like, do I need this sentence? Do I need that sentence? Because a thousand words is not very much. Um, definitely getting multiple people to read it. You know, you might spend a lot of time talking about something that just isn't that relevant. And so you're definitely just going to need other perspectives to kind of help you like hone in on what's necessary. Um, yeah. yeah. Thanks. I, I appreciate that, Sam. Abhinav, how did you um, approach your statement of purpose? Um, any any kind of tips that you might want to give? Thank you. So I, 
I actually pivoted to climate sphere. I am an engineer by training. So my statement of purpose basically was focused on why I pivoted from metallurgical and materials engineering to climate climate sphere. So I talked about uh, metallurgical and materials industry, which is like 8% of greenhouse gas emission is contributed towards them. So that is what I focused on. And and I have worked in an NGO nonprofit, so I try to relate my practical experience over there and how climate is impacting vulnerable population. That is what I focused on. And regarding the timeline, it's always better to start as early as possible. I started in September, and like Victoria and other panelists already mentioned, don't be afraid to write multiple drafts. It took me several drafts to finalize my application. So, and it's always helpful to get advice from someone which is already in an university on all or who can guide you in the process. So that's what I did. Thanks, Abhinav. Out of curiosity, when, and I mentioned this, but um, maybe some of you already answered this, when do you know it's finished? When did you decide this is a finished product? I'm submitting it. So uh, that's like, it, it's a little tricky question. It's, you always, when you get feedback, it's always like you need to change something. It's It feels like it's never finished. But at some point of time, when you get a feedback from your professor, like I was lucky that many of my friends, some of my friends were already in the US universities doing similar course. So when they sort of gave me ad advice that lit, this looks a little okay, like now it's a little okay. Right. grammatically flow is correct so that when i realized okay now is the time that i should submit and finalize this draft so excellent and then finally emily can you share um kind of your experience and approach to the statement of purpose yeah absolutely um so kind of like victoria um i feel like i was a like I was applying to just a bunch of different opportunities my senior year. So I feel like I had like a similar trajectory in that I knew I wanted to get involved um, in the climate space and with environmental justice. And I also wrote about um, kind of how my, my background and heritage um, influences my involvement in undergrad. Um, I think that like that was especially um, relevant to me because I feel like I wanted to explain like why I was passionate about environment and environmental justice um, while as and use that as like an explanation for like why I've done so many like random um, climate related tasks like across from so many different disciplines and so like climate related like opportunities. Um, and so I wrote about um, my, I wrote about just like a passion for environmental education. Um, sorry, my cat's making some noise, but um, <laughs> as a, um, I wrote about just a passion for environmental education coming from a um, like first gen low income background and seeing like members of my community not being super um, aware on, climate crisis effects in their day-to-day -day life. Um, and I also wrote about my, like growing up, my dad and his, gra my grandparents, so his parents were migrant farmers um, and traveled kind of across the US um, and kind of experienced a lot of the um, specificities of the climate crisis um, really like through their labor and through their direct work. So um, I wrote about kind of how like learning from them and um, hearing their like stories and experiences shaped my climate passion. Um, in terms of like when I started and when I considered it finished, um, I, I definitely I'm a procrastinator, so I definitely I probably started it way too late. Um, to be entirely honest, but I think like one thing that was helpful for me when writing, um, is being mindful of the word limit. Like having your first draft be like say like everything you possibly want to say. Like just like get kind of all the thoughts that are in your head out there, and then as you're editing, cut down and like synthesize. Um, but definitely like I feel like that's like a barrier for me in writing um is I tend to be very wordy and I tend to like there's a lot of like I feel like ephemera that gets lost in like the nuance of what I'm trying to say so I think just putting it all out there in a first draft and letting some friends read it over um and then going over it with another pair of eyes um was helpful for me like when writing that's really great advice and and um Emily just out of curiosity you mentioned feedback who did you was it peers that you asked to take a read? Did you, did, is there anybody that you used that was really helpful in providing feedback on the statement? Yeah, um, I, I, so I, I think I like, when I was brainstorming, I honestly, I talked to my dad a little, like just, um, I like, he never, I never like sent him my essay to read over, but like I, 
like just like talked to him some ideas with him when I was like talking about my application and what I was interested in pursuing um because also his background and like my upbringing is like directly related to um research I'm going to pursue in the long term um in a PhD program so I'm kind of exploring more of those ideas like right now while working on those applications but um it was like brainstorming with my dad and then um I had a bunch of my friends like I had my partner read over my essay like just I feel like people who like knew me really well um and could speak to like my passions but also people who I trusted to be like to actually be critical and like um not necessarily just be like oh this looks great like send it in but people who I knew would actually give me like solid feedback on where needs clarification um and where needs like where's like good um so seeking feedback from peers and like peers I was close to and then lastly I showed um I sent a draft of my statement to all of the um, people who I'd asked to write me letters of recommendation. Um, so I guess that's another like kind of recommender tip, but I thought that was like helpful for um, them and kind of seeing like what I was thinking about pursuing in graduate school. And then um, I got feedback from one of them specifically, like we worked on it. She, like she gave me feedback and like she reviewed um, a couple more drafts for me. That's great. That's great insight. Um... Did anybody, I know Abhinav briefly mentioned that he sought feedback from fellow peers that were already studying in US universities, so they were familiar with that process. Um, did anybody else, um, Victoria or Sam, did you have anybody that you sought feedback from that, that you felt was helpful? Um, yeah, I mean, I, I definitely sent it to, um, uh, you know, like just people I knew who like had experience in that process um, yeah. with like applications um, and, and sometimes it is kind of hard and like to have those resources um, if you're currently at an educational institution you definitely like have an advantage because like there are a lot of people you know maybe the writing center maybe like a different faculty or something um, but yeah yeah definitely definitely people who have a lot of experience with that process like friends is definitely a good thing but sometimes having someone who's a bit older a bit more like experienced in the field is also um someone who could be helpful thanks and victoria did you have any um in terms of feedback or did you receive any feedback that actually was really helpful or allowed you to, to make some significant alterations for example even? um honestly i just thought about it because like emily brought up how she sell um, shared it with her friends and her partner. I honestly, like my, so my mom is a lawyer. And so I used to have her read my stuff like all the time in undergrad. And like, it is like pretty, like, I don't know why, but like working with like strangers to like someone from your career office, it might be a little intimidating. Like sometimes receiving like feedback can be like, um, like a little intimidating. Cause like sometimes they're telling you to rewrite a pair, like rephrase a sentence to rewriting like your whole essay. So it was nice because like I felt like sharing it with someone that like I knew in case you don't have immediate access to a career center right now is like it, like if someone like who knows you will just like give it to you straight like they'll be like this doesn't sound like you at all um and it's just I honestly thought that feedback was helpful but like if you do like have a career center at um um right now like I would also use that as well because they've definitely they know their stuff when it comes to applications they can tell you like okay you don't want to use this word or like this phrase like in a personal statement as far as like why you can't use something specific i don't know but like they've been doing this for like a long time so i thought both like people like who have close relationships and then also people who work in the career space excellent so what i'm going to go ahead and do is what i'd like we have a couple minutes left i'd like to now open up certainly to the q a um and allow our panelists to specifically answer questions from our, oops, sorry, forgive me. Um, didn't mean to do that. Or maybe should I drop the screen, guys? What's everybody feel? Should I drop the screen? Should we stop share? Anybody have strong feelings about it? I'll just- Stopping the screen, yeah, that's fine. Let's do it, okay. All right, excellent, guys. Okay, so um, should we go ahead and actually, Carrie, is, um, is there any questions that you think came in that are particularly compelling that we should do a shout out for? I think there are a lot of questions I, I think about individual applications or application requirements. Um, I, I think those, if you want to reach out to us at admissions at climate.columbia.edu, we can certainly answer those questions. I would encourage everyone to 
um, submit questions now that really are, are geared towards our panelists and things that they can answer. Um, this is a, an excellent opportunity to get their insights um, and feedback on, on their application process. So if you have any questions for them, please submit those in the Q&A box. So I just want to note, um, I'm just looking at them now, and this might be a question that everybody's interested in, And but um, our panelists might not find that exciting, but I can answer it, and I have gotten this question a couple of times. We ask that you that your recommenders write on company letterhead, and if they left the company, there's questions, does it have to be? There is flexibility with company letterhead, so if there is a circumstance where they do not have access to that any longer, um, Lily specifically asked the question. They don't have to be. We have flexibility as it relates to that. The most important thing, though, is avoiding personal email addresses. Um, so I just recommend avoiding personal email addresses if that's helpful. One thing I want to throw. Sorry. Yeah, no. Um, one thing I want to add real quick is that um, a lot of the students, I think, in the cohort are definitely older than um, the people on this panel. Um, not entirely, but, um, you know, there are some people who are like in their 30s and 40s and um, even older. So I, I think that should I think that's just something that really enhances the program. It's just because you kind of have like this intergenerational perspective on climate change. Um, but, you know, I, I saw someone talking about like, being older and what that's like. And there's definitely a big age diversity in this program. I'm just now that, thank you so much, Sam, for addressing that because I'm just now typing to the, the attendee. I want them to email me and I can connect them with a more seasoned learner if that's something that they would like just to gain perspective, for example, even from the program, I'm happy to do that. So I'm just now typing to them um, and thank you for, for referencing that. Any, any other questions? Um, Uh, that we see another question does do I need to ask for a TOEFL waiver if I'm not a native English but I have an undergrad degree from um, Lily you should be already automatically waived if the application system gives you any issue requesting a TOEFL then feel free to email me I'll make sure that that gets waived for you but if English um, was the sole language of instruction in your undergraduate university we can certainly get that waived not a problem Offer, there are a lot of questions about resume length, professional versus academic. This came up so much. I'm so glad you guys asked about this. And actually, that is good for the panel. So believe it or not, our application keeps it very broad. It's at the applicant's discretion how they want to approach the resume length um, or what they want to include. The one thing that we do ask for is that you do include your academic and professional journey in the, app, in the resume, but we do not dictate length. Um, or we do not, we also do not dictate the exact format. Does anybody on the panel want to share if you can recall, you know, again, there's a lot of flexibility. It's, it's at the applicant's discretion, but does that does anybody have any general advice about their resume, how they approached it, what they felt they that was actually Abhinav, I know you were a working professional. Could you share a little bit? Yeah, so I can thank you. Uh regarding the length of the resume or CV, it's like you mentioned, it's not a fixed thing. The only thing that I would recommend is you should not repeat the same thing, like same experience, similar kind of experience. You should not be repetitive about it because again, it's become a little odd saying the same skill set again and again. So you should keep it short, like short in the sense if you are having multiple kind of experiences, you should definitely put it forward. And at the same time, it should not be repetitive and don't worry about the length because I had, I was a working professional. I had a one and a half page resume. So. So it was okay. I think it it was okay. Thanks, Abhinav. We so one thing. Yeah, sorry, no, one no. thing I was just gonna throw in there um, was that I worked on a um, personal website. I thought that that was really effective because I could incorporate like a lot more details into that without having like an eight page resume. Um, and then it's also just more interactive with like pictures and things. Um, so, so I think, you know, and I just had a link to that at the top of my um, resume. And so I think that's something that just generally, no matter who you're applying for, is uh, generally helpful for your application. 
Something we did, we're getting in the Q&A, Emily, you might've spotted it. There's some questions about Diamondstein Spielvogel. Um, and I myself have been getting questions about this. Students wanted to know um, about your approach to that statement of purpose. How much of your original statement did you incorporate within that? Obviously there's some overarching themes. Can you speak to just how you approach Diamondstein Spielvogel's um, statement of purpose? Yeah, absolutely. Um, so I, I like like you said, there's a lot of overlap, I think, between my interest in like studying climate and like why I applied to the Diamondstein Spielvogel um, fellowship in the first place. Um, so I tried to um, like one thing, another thing that I didn't mention um, when we were talking about statements of purpose, but I would send like both of my Diamondstein Spielvogel drafts and my statement of purpose to the folks who were reviewing it to also verify that there wasn't like a ton of like repetitiveness between the two, um, because I feel like that's like while while there is a lot of overlap like I didn't want to basically just like have the same um reiterative content again and again so um what I did in Diamond Steen Spielvogel um was I kind of used that space to elaborate just a little bit more on why um I am like really interested in migrant farm work and climate justice um and kind of talk about like why that's influenced my studies and how I like hope to apply that in my future career goals um, and in my future research. And then also use that space to talk a little bit more about some of the specifics of um, programs that I like participated in or um, like the, I know I talked a little bit about the course I taught about climate justice um, and engineering school at Rice because that was like a really significant um, thing that I had did, done in my senior year and spent a lot of time on um, and also was, um, like a had a very like um prominent environmental justice and climate justice component. So I yeah, I use like that space to talk just a little bit more about like myself, um, kind of where I see myself adding um climate justice and those like perspectives to um the program. And yeah, that's kind of what I did in that. That's great. Thank you for that, Emily. Um in turn and there was quite a few questions that got answered as a result of it. So I appreciate that especially. I, um, we are coming up on time here. There is one question that I just kind of really, I, I was partial to, I really liked it. Somebody asked, what's the most exciting aspect of being a climate and society student? Does anybody want to address that? It's not as re related to the state, um, forgive me, the application tips and strategies, but this is an opportunity for you guys to kind of highlight what you enjoy about the program. And you can even highlight challenges. Feel free to be authentic guys too. <laughs> Um, I guess I'll go first. Um, I really like um, just learning with other people who are really passionate about like, you know, solving problems and making the world a better place. And some people are like really just like at the cutting edge of that. Like, you know, there's so many just like lectures with like people in the field right now who are like actively making things so much better. And it's just like, it's really cool to be here and to be around all these different people and different ideas and opportunities. Yeah. Emily? Um, I agree with Sam. Um, I think also that the city of New York just has a lot to offer in terms of events and lectures and climate space. Um, I also really think the flexibility, one of my favorite things about the program is like the flexibility of the electives. I feel like I, um, I'm in two electives right now. Um, one, my cat, my cat's making noise. Um, one is in the documentary or it's in the oral history um, master's program. And one is in the women, gender and sexuality studies program. Um, it's called planetary questions, but both kind of speak to like other interests that I have that are, um, and allow me to kind of explore climate and society material um, in a different like realm of Columbia. So I think it's really um, important that the climate school like has so much flexibility as what courses you can take as electives. Um, and that's like one of the main reasons I picked this program. Thanks, Emily. How about Victoria? Yeah, I really like a lot of people already talked about it already, but I really like how this program is very like intersectional and like the work that they do. Like one of the reasons like why I wanted to do a master's is that my undergrad was very STEM heavy and working in a lab and I wanted more exposure into studying the social inequities that do exist within the climate space. And there are definitely like a lot of classes here, both like in the climate school and also other programs, other grad programs at Columbia are starting to dive into, which is really nice. Like I'm in this class this semester that's through 
actually wait, SUMA might be a part of the climate school, so maybe that doesn't count, but um, uh, geographies of environmental justice and sustainability. And I remember like finding that class and I was so happy because like that um, professor who's teaching that is focused on creating an entire like cohort of classes solely focused on environmental justice. And also just like the passion is there among the faculty, like in the students, like there's just like a lot of like really cool people here who like Sam said focus on making the world a better place because <laughs> we definitely need to do that like now <laughs> I love it thank you and Avina uh, like everyone else mentioned the interdisciplinary program it's quite good like people have so much of different experience and also learning from professors who are at the forefront of the research going on in climate sphere so that's what the most attractive part of the climate and society program is Excellent. Well, I just wanted to say thank you, everybody. I'm sorry we couldn't get to all questions, but what I do recommend is that any questions that went unanswered, please feel free to email the admissions inbox. In fact, if you just respond to the email with the webinar link, it'll come right to our admissions inbox with any questions that you need answered. Um, I just want to say huge thank you. Um, number one, Carrie, who's off camera right now, but Carrie, huge thank you for again helping us manage the, the Q&A um, and the spotlighting. And then big, big thank you and shout out to our panelists, you know, Sam, Emily, Victoria, Avanov, you have lent so much great insight today. I'm certain all of our participants found value in this session and kind of hearing how you guys approached your applications. And um, I just wanna tell everybody, for those of you based here in the United States that might be celebrating um, the Thanksgiving holiday, safe travels, and um, and I hope everybody has kind of a, a wonderful rest of the week. And I really look forward to seeing applications submitted by the priority deadline, January 15th. It is coming up, okay? You blink and it's here. So, um, so once again, thank you everybody. And I really appreciate everyone's time.